Hi, good morning and welcome to the Urban Refuge. If you are new with us today, we are so glad to have you here. For us, church is so much more than just a Sunday service. And we want you to know that there is a place for you here at the Urban Refuge. One of the best ways you can get connected with us is to text welcome you are to 97000. Later this week, someone on staff will connect with you. And uh, at this time, we're going to kind of keep going on with the service. We have some music. We have three worship songs. Then I'll come back, give some more announcements. Then we're going to hear from Pastor Andy Gray today on the topic of joy. So let's get into it. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Um, glad to be with you this morning. My name is Josh Peterson. Uh, I had the privilege of leading worship last week. Last week. Um, and uh, just so happy to be here, uh, so thankful uh, to be worshiping with you today. Um, knowing that many of you are probably still continuing to celebrate Christmas, we integrated a few uh, fun Christmas songs uh, this morning. And so uh, please join us as we sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Oh, come, let us adore Him. 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 Oh, come, let us ad
Welcome back. I just have a few announcements and we'll continue on with the rest of the service. Mark your calendars for our next church update meeting on the evening of Thursday, January 21st. We will be presenting an overview of the 2020 and looking forward to 2021. We'll also be sharing an update on the church governance, the bylaws, and the process of forming our new board. More information will be provided in early January. Year-end giving. Oh man, can you believe it? We're almost through 2020. And as we make final preparations to step into what we feel God is calling us to do in 2021, we also need to make sure we finish uh, strong in 2020 and finish in a healthy place financially. The good news is this, we are a financially healthy church thanks to the faithful giving and generosity of so many of you. While that is true, we still need a strong December to finish the year well and set ourselves up well for 2021. Year-end giving is important to our church, and for your gift to be considered a 2020 contribution, your check must be dated in 2020 and be given to the Urban Refuge in 2020. All mailed gifts must be postmarked by December 35th, 31st. Excuse me. You may also give online. If you have any questions, email us at info at theurbanrefuge.com. At this point, we're going to hear from Pastor Andy Gray on the topic of joy. And I hope that God blesses you through it. All right. God bless you. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Those are warm salutations that's always nice to hear at this time of year. You know, the rest of the year, other holidays, you're never greeted with such warm, kind, and fuzzy comments or expressions. It's during Christmas and New Year's that you get that. It's probably one of the things that gets us through all the hustle and bustle, you know, kind of like going to Target or taking your kids there maybe or yourself and stressing out about different gifts and stuff that you're trying to get and you're going through the line and you're like, all right, I need to get my game face on and wish somebody a Merry Christmas with a big smile. Or maybe you're like, I just can't muster it today. And somebody says it to you and it gives you a little momentary ability to make it through and put a smile back on your face. And being merry and being happy, those are, those are really nice things, but they're temporal, aren't they? Kind of fleeting doesn't seem like it takes any time at all until we pass by, pass by the buzz of the moment of the holidays and we set in for these cold, dark days of winter ahead here in January. And I want to talk about something today that gets us beyond that, beyond being happy, beyond being merry, something that has more sustaining power, lasting, like it'll keep going on. Can you guess what that is? I bet you can. It's joy. Joy is different than being merry, than being happy. You know, those are both the results of something that external is going on and it kind of works away into our fabric and thoughts and attitude for a little while. Something agreeable that happens in our lives and we're merry and we're happy for a little bit. So they go from the outside in. But joy is something that springs from the inside out as a different source. So let's pray and then we'll talk about that today. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your sweet gift of mercy and kindness, especially shown through Jesus Christ. Remember that very well here, just coming off of Christmas, that he was a gift to the whole world and a gift to us. Thank you for sending him. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving us, caring for us, for being so wonderful, mercifully uh, merciful towards us and showing us the greatest extent of your care through giving your very life for us. What a pleasure, what a joy, what a treasure it really is to know that you love us so much. Father, we pray for joy today. We pray that we'd understand it a little bit more, that that place within us that's the source of joy and hope would grow, 
so that it's a lived expression into our lives. So help us to learn, help us to see what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the scripture passage we're going to look at today is from Romans chapter 5, 1 through 11. And if you want, I know you're at home and we can't do this together, and sometimes we do this at church. If you want to stand up while I read the scripture, you don't have to for sure, but it's maybe a symbolic way or just a practice for the moment of recognizing the word of God is inspired by him. It's not just words of persons written down. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it's embodied in the life of Jesus Christ. So feel free, if you want, to stand up while I read through this scripture, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Why we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Amen. Thanks for the word of God. Joy is different than happiness. As I mentioned, happiness is kind of an outside thing, whereas joy it's an inside out thing. So what's that mean? Well, Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit, right? It's, it's what's evidenced by a heart, a life, a soul, a mind, a body that's transformed and rooted in God's love. And it tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all these things that flow out of our life and love and joy and peace. Those are right there at the top three. And joy is right behind love. Can you imagine if what the church was known for, if what we were most known for is, man, those folks, just those three, they're, they're a people of love. They're a people of joy. They're a people of peace. What would our lives be like if that was like our main mode of operation? the way we regularly go through life, those are just, just so flowing in our life. What would the witness be like of people that were watching us and observing us and seeing, man, love, joy, and peace just keeps floating out of those people. I don't know what to do with that. That sure is appealing. Sometimes I think we've lost our way of what it means to follow Christ, what it means to live out our faith before him. We, we kind of get into so many things of trying to express what's right and wrong. And there's, there's things to point out for sure. But are we evidencing those fruits of the Spirit? And, you know, the thing with fruit is, is, is fruit's not something that you're supposed to just work at, right? It's not, fruit is not something that gets produced by hard work. A tree, when it produces fruit, it's basically receiving sun and water and it's pressing its roots down deep into the soil to take up nourishment from what's there. And the combination of those things makes the tree strong and healthy. And when that happens, it bears fruit. And I think the same is true for us as Christ followers, or at least it should be. We receive the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We drink the spirit from his word and through praying, and our roots grow down deep 
into the Father's love. And when we do that, we're healthy. When we do that, we inevitably will bear fruit. And that's a good thing. It's an outpouring. It's something that's from the inside out, as I said. So let's look a little bit at Romans 5, starting in verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Since we have been justified through faith. Now, other religions usually teach if your conduct is good, if your words are right, if your attitudes are positive, if uh, you're good enough, you'll somehow get God's approval. It's a little bit like uh, bad onions and good potatoes, <laughs> right? Like if you have enough good potatoes in your life versus those bad onions, those things that you do that are wrong or misdeeds or even wicked things or what have you, if, you're, if your potatoes, the good potatoes outweigh the onions, then God will accept you. And sometimes we live that way in our Christian life, right? As followers of Christ, we, at least in our attitude, we might not like know something underneath the bottom, but we live, if, if I performed well, then I think God feels pretty good about me, and so I kind of feel pretty good about myself. But God's approval isn't based on just our actions alone. It's not, it's not based on that. It's based on Him. It's based on His love for us. And the scripture says that we have been justified by faith. Now, I want you to slow that down a little bit. Justified by faith. Just if I'd. Just if I'd. You ever thought about that? Just if I'd done right. Just if I'd thought right. Just if I'd said right. That's what faith in Jesus Christ does. It's an embracing his merciful sacrifice that when our relationship with God is examined, what God sees is Jesus Christ. And it's just as if we had done everything right. The Bible tells us he's made us holy and blameless in his sight. And therefore, we have peace. We are at peace with God because of our faith, and we've been justified through faith. That's good news. That's sweet. Like, that's something inside that can produce joy. And, and verse 2 here goes on to say, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have peace with God because we've been made right through him, and he's cleansed us, and he's brought us anew, and we're a part of his body, adopted as sons and daughters. And we have a hope because of that. And we can rejoice in hope. And what kind of hope is that? It's this unwavering, uncompromising, unfaltering hope of God's commitment towards us. He redeemed us. He loved us. Scripture tells us we can never be snatched from his hand. We've been put into him. We've been marked with the Holy Spirit as a permanent possession, and we get to be with God in his presence for all of eternity. That's hopeful. That springs joy on the inside of us. It, it should, anyway. And that's, that's some, you know, that's like joy producing nourishment. That's like some rich soul to be in. No matter what comes in this world, we know planted deep down that God is looking us at us just if we'd done everything right because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. And we know we're going home. Ultimately, we're going to go home. I know a lot of you didn't get to travel this year. You didn't get to go to that place that maybe has wonderful, positive, warm memories for you to, to go home. Our home is not here in this world. Our ultimate home is with God forever. And no matter what goes on in this world, we are going to our true home. And we'll be there for all eternity with God's love and presence with us. Like, that's hopeful. That's joyful. 
Now that doesn't mean we don't encounter strife in this world. We don't have suffering that we have to go through. In fact, Jesus said this in John 16, 33. He said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace because in this world you will have trouble. You will. Like, it's coming. We will. But take heart. I've overcome the world. So he's saying, listen, don't lose heart. Don't lose your joy. I've overcome the world. And whatever goes on, whatever trouble may come your way, I'm here. Don't lose heart. I've been thinking about suffering this year. Uh, there's been a lot of suffering in so many ways. Um, some very personal things in our life, the loss of my mom and diff different challenges that have been hard. And of course, COVID and not being able to meet and all these things. You know, when I was a kid, <clears throat> we'd play these things called records. <laughs> and some of you are with me, you know exactly what that is. Others don't. There are LPs and 45s and different names that we've had for them. And if you weren't careful with this vinyl record, uh, they would get scratched. And of course, as young kids, we were not very careful in almost all of our albums because we didn't put them back in the jacket and all that stuff. They'd get scratched. And so they'd, you'd go to play them. And if there was a bad scratch, every time the, the album would go around and it would hit the needle, there would be a skip. And it would jump back. Usually it would jump back. And then you'd hear the same part of the song over again. And it would hit that scratch again. And then it would jump back. And you'd just be stuck in this repetitive loop of listening to the same short bit of the song over and over and over again. That's what 2020 has felt like. Draw, it's drawing to a close. We're nearing the end. But... <laughs> But if I were to guess, if we did an uh, audio transcription of every sermon given throughout the year here, you would hear the words unprecedented, difficult, or hard, or suffering, or pandemic in 95% of them. It's just been so imprinted on us, and we're just stuck in that loop of playing it over and over and over again. And it makes sense. There's been real loss real pain, real suffering this year. But I'm giving you a heads up, church. Um, I'm not going to do that anymore. Now, I'm not trying to like make a vow before God here <laughs> or that I'll never say a thing, but I I'm not going to just keep playing that loop on repeat over and over again. I, I, I don't want to spend my life doing that. I don't want you to spend your life doing that, of focusing just on the suffering. Now, it's good to have a theology of suffering. I mean, it's good to have how do I follow God in the midst of hardship and a practice of what to do. And if you participated in our small groups this fall, that blue series that uh, Fellowship Church and Pastor Albert Tate shared with us, it was fantastic. And that was what it was all about on how to walk through suffering in a meaningful, helpful, purposeful way. And the whole premise or a big picture snapshot of it was, hey, it's okay to not be okay, but don't be uh, not okay alone and invite God into it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death. The idea is through the valley, not just into it and you get stuck there. It's going through it and it's been a valley. That's okay. And I don't want you to think that if you're mourning or if you're struggling with loss that myself or any of the other leadership here wouldn't mourn with those who mourn. Well, we would be with you and empathize and engage and, and walk with you through suffering. I'm just talking about not leading from a place and teaching from a place that we always come back to, isn't it such a hard time? Isn't it so difficult? Isn't it challenging that we didn't get to meet like we wanted to, that we couldn't do all the things that we hoped to do? You know, Ecclesiastes 3, 4 says, there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Well, I, I just want to, uh, I want to dance again. I want to laugh again. I want to enjoy more time. I, I don't want to play a record that's just, uh, stuck in a skip pattern. 
And when that would happen as kids, you'd actually have to go over to the phonograph machine or player or whatever you want to call it, and you'd have to lift up the needle, you'd have to move it forward, and put it back down, and then the songs would go on. And sometimes I think that's what we need to do. We need to lift up our eyes from the place that we're stuck and broken in and go forward, take a step forward and start going on with the rest of the song. Let's look at verse three. It says this, <clears throat> not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. What I want to do here is, as we look forward, instead of, uh, you know, there's a Christmas song that talks about uh, repeat the sounding joy. I think I've been repeating the sounding suffering in my head, maybe in the way we teach, the way I've been teaching. We need to repeat the sounding joy. And the scripture here tells us that not only do we have this eternal hope that we're going to be with God someday. We're going to go home. We're going to be with Jesus. He's preparing rooms for us. But we can rejoice in the midst of suffering. And there's perseverance in there. There's character in there that comes from that perseverance. And out of that comes hope. So it's, it's not necessarily just this, you know, flip a switch or just move the needle and, hey, you just go on. There's, there's some process to that. But we've been doing that. We've, we have been suffering, we have been persevering, and it's building character. You know, those are not things like your kids want to hear when you have to say no to something or there's a difficult dynamic that they're going through. Like, hey, you're, you're building character. But character is so good. It's so helpful. And, you know, looking back on my parenting, I'm not sure I always let perseverance finish its work. It's really easy to jump in and want to bring comfort to our kids, especially in our culture. And that might be true of your own life too as an adult. Like we look for ways to just be comfortable. And sometimes we miss perseverance is doing a good thing right now. It's building character in me. It's building hope. But suffering what is that? What, I mean, how bad does suffering have to get to be called suffering? Well, of course, there's variations of that in depths and intensity. But if you wanted a quick, thoughtful or thought definition to think about, I would say this. Suffering is said to be the loss of favorable circumstances, whatever that might be. It might be small, might feel insignificant, it might be substantial, right? But it's a loss of favorable circumstances. And happiness comes when you get some favorable news, right? Like I got a raise, we got the house that we bid on, we have enough to cover rent, uh, we got a gift this month of food, or I got what I wanted on my Christmas list. Uh, I remember one particular Christmas as a kid uh, where I received not just one, but like every gift was just awesome. Like, I was just, like, couldn't believe it. Usually, you know, I'd get some socks and some clothes or whatever, and there was, you know, one gift that was kind of cool. Uh, but this particular year, uh, I don't know how old I was, probably 12, 13. I, I just loved every single gift that I got. And I, I was just elated for a while. <laughs> Happiness is pretty fleeting, um, you know, I'm kind of a hard guy to buy for now. There's not much material things, but, you know, if you all want to drop off that Lexus 350H, you know, those kind of commercials that you see with a big red bow in my driveway, that's, that might put a smile on my face. That'd be all right. <laughs> hey, I'll even settle for the Toyota version. That'd be all right. Avalon Hybrid. I'm playing. <laughs> Just messing with you. That Christmas, though, I was happy for a while. And then life came along, the gifts faded, more divorce happened, more struggle, tension, strain, stuff going on with kids at school, being threatened to get beat up, all, all, all this kind of stuff. 
wasn't very long before those Christmas gifts didn't mean a whole lot anymore. Happiness comes and goes with favorable circumstances. You know, I think they're a bit like a sugar high. You feel good for a little while, but you know you need some broccoli to live, right? <laughs> like you can't just live off of candy canes and cookies. You need some broccoli. It's all right to ask God to put a little cheese on it. That's okay. Make it a little more palatable. But we need things to develop. Persevere, perseverance and character and hope and suffering does that. Happiness is derived from those outside-in circumstances. I think they lead us to three places if we're, if we're really fixated on happiness. Um, you know, you can't just try all the time for things to go your way to make things favorable. I mean, you can, but you're going to get stuck in a groove because those are sugar highs. And I would say this three things that you might end up as uh, addicted, detached, or insufferable. You get addicted because you'll do whatever you can to have the sugar rush, the happy rush. Shop more, drink more, eat more, all kinds of things more, and, and more is never enough. It's an insatiable desire, and that, that's how addiction happens. I, I want to feel good so I don't have to feel these other things. So that's one thing, addicted. The other one is detached. And detached is, you know what? I give up. I'm not hoping anymore for anything. Because hope disappoints. Because I'm wanting to be happy, and it never works out. And so the best way for me to go through life to make it through is to not hope for anything. And then I'll never be disappointed. And that detaches you from life, from God, from people. And it's not a healthy place to live. And the last one is it makes you insufferable. <laughs> because if you're trying to be happy and you're not getting it and you're not detaching, so you're still trying you start to look at all the people around you and say, you're the reason I'm not happy. You take it out on them. And they get to experience your frustration of, I don't have sugar, I don't have candy for my soul, whatever that might be, and you're the obstacle to me getting that. Either that or you just walk around complaining all the time. Maybe you're not blaming other people, but... Everything stinks. You're just insufferable because you complain all the time. I'm not trying to be harsh with you. I'm just trying to help us to wake up, to, to not be stuck in that loop over and over again. I've, I've had my moments of all of those. But we don't have to live that way. So how do we find joy in suffering when there's loss of these favorable circumstances? Look at what verse 5 says here. It says, And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. Now, I'm thinking that means a little something different, this God pouring out his love, than this big picture, God really loves us. You know, we have John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Like, God loves us. We talked about that. He's, he's forgiven us, and we get to have this eternal promise of hope in him for all time and in his presence. And that, that's a big deal. Like, that's, that's a deep spring root of joy. But this part, I think, uh, there's more to it. And there's a couple things that I think amplify God's love so we can hear it better and experience it better Why we're on the journey and it sustains us. It keeps us going. It's what enables us uh, to have joy, rejoice, even in the midst of suffering. So the first one's related to this God pouring out. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been lost? Lost, but you're, you're still confident you're going to make it home somehow. Like, you're not so lost that you're like, I'm going to die out here. 
that's a little terrifying. <laughs> but you're lost in a way that, well, somehow, some way, I'm going to get back home. Maybe, you know, in this day and age now, it's just like you lost your GPS signal and you don't know when it's going to come back on, but you think, well, if I keep driving far enough, I'm going to find something, a gas station or something, or maybe the GPS signal is going to come back in. I know it's dark out and I'm trying to see, and you turn the radio down so you can see better. Isn't that funny? You turn the radio down so you can see better. It's weird. You can't see any better with the radio turned down. But you can focus. You can think a little bit. And you strain and you look. And then something happens. And you see a sign. Or you see something that gives you your bearing again. Maybe the GPS signal pops back on. You're like, oh, there we go. And you feel a sense of relief. And you feel a sense of, okay, I'm on the road again, and now I have a better idea of how I'm going to make it home. I think that's what God pouring out his love looks like in our life. It's not just the big, grand, eternal, immeasurable promise of forgiveness and salvation. That's a big deal. And it's not just assurance about going home. It's a pouring out of his love through the Spirit. And it can come in a lot of different ways. Reading the Word of God, the Bible, is, of course, one really big one. This last Monday night, I was having a terrible time sleeping. I had uh, thoughts just bouncing around in my head and decisions to make that are heavy on my mind and just tossing back and forth. I tried for a couple hours to get to sleep. It wasn't happening, so I got up. And I pulled out the Bible and started reading and reading and went on reading for a while. And I didn't honestly get a precise answer about what to do or what's next exactly. But I got a sign that showed up along that dark highway that I was stuck in, this groove, this pattern of going back and playing things over and over in my mind. And it was something that I felt like God said, here's something to help you get closer to home. And it was as if God was pouring out his love by saying, <clears throat> I see you. I'm speaking to you. I'm not giving you the whole answer that you need right now, but I'm guiding you. And here's some, here's some guardrails to keep you safe. Maybe I'll tell you the story someday. It's, uh, it's not a catastrophic deal or anything, but it was, it was so comforting to me that I finished reading whatever section I was in, and I was like, ah, I think I can go to sleep now. There was a peace that restored. There was a rejoicing in my heart that came, like, oh, God's in this. God's leading. God's not going anywhere, <clears throat> and he's pointing me. He's bringing me home. Still have some ambiguity, I don't have complete clarity, but I'm restored to a place of peace. <clears throat> that was a good thing. That's what pouring outs of love look like. Come through, <clears throat> excuse me, God's word, and they can come through a friend. I was talking with someone today and hear, to hear their uh, encouragement, uh, uh, just something particular in my life. It wasn't a small thing. It wasn't like they wrote me or spoke a big, grand expression they just said something really short. I don't know, six, seven words or whatever. And I was like, oh, that is really meaningful. That's really refreshing. It's restorative. It reminds me. God's around. He's leading. He's here. And I'm heading home someday. And this is just a little bit helpful of keeping me going on the path, even though you know, whatever circumstances might be less favorable in the moment. Man, that felt good. It felt like a little love tap from God. God likes to do those things. He likes to outpour. So that's one. Lots of ways that that can happen. Uh, this one is a little bit different, though. And maybe you've not thought about it. I, I don't know that I've thought about it this way, but as I was studying this, it made me uh, think about this. And I'm going to read verses 7 through 11. It says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. 
While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of a son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. It's just kind of interesting here. It's going on, it's kind of talking about all these things, joy, uh, joy, we have hope, we have perseverance, character, hope that never fails, and we can rejoice in suffering. And then comes along with this conversation about wrath. <laughs> like, what? How does that fit in there? Going from hope and joy to talking about God's wrath. How is that connected? And that's not something that we talk about really often, you know. Uh, the Bible tells us that God is love, so it makes sense to talk about and explore the expressions and the way that God loves us. But uh, there's a wrath component about God, too. And, I, you know, going back to my uh, record playing days, there was something called 45s because that was the speed that you played the record at. The albums were 33 and a third RPMs per minute, and the 45s were 45 RPMs per minute. So they went around faster. There was always an A side to the record and a B side. And the A side was usually the hit song. That's why you would buy the 45. And then the B side was a bonus song or a lame song. <laughs> they would just throw on the back. Once in a while, a B song would be a hit, but usually it was just the A song. And uh, sometimes I think, uh, talking about God's wrath, we kind of think of it like the B side. Like, uh, I really don't. I just want to hear the A side. I want to hear the love side. I want to hear the grace side. I want to hear the mercy side. I want to hear the I'm with you side. I'm bringing you home side. I want that song. I want to sing that lyric. That's the one I want to dance to. I don't want to listen to, to something that's a little harder to hear. It's not a hit song. It's not as easy on the, on the ears. It doesn't necessarily make my... Uh, bones get up and want to want to move a little bit. It's the B side, but it's a good side. God doesn't have a better and a lesser than side to him. He's a holistic God, and there's a beauty if we can understand it. And in the way we think about wrath, a lot of times is like I'm super irritated with you, and I'm going to pour out my annoyance with you, and you're going to feel my wrath. That's not what God is doing. That's not what wrath is about. It's not about annoyance, irritation. Like, I've been trying to put up with you, and I have had enough. That's not what it's about. Wrath is about righteous justice and judgment. It's the corresponding consequences for what wrong was done. And you're wondering maybe, like, well, how does thinking about wrath sustain or build my joy. I want you to imagine you have a roommate um, and you get home from work and uh, they're sitting at the table and you see some envelopes on the table and it looks like some mail's been opened up and your roommate says, hey, I uh, opened up your mail and before you get mad, just want to let you know it was a bill and I paid it for you. And at first class, you might be like, hmm, what are you doing opening my mail? But on the other hand, you're like, eh, it's not, <laughs> not so bad. It didn't turn out so bad. And uh, gosh, you think, thanks. Uh, you didn't have to do that. And maybe it's your cell phone bill or something. It's 100 bucks, And you've been thinking, yeah, I could, I could have taken care of that myself. Like, you didn't need to do that. And fine. And you kind of just, you know, like, ah, nice, thanks. Put a little smile on your face, a little happy moment, and you go on your way. What if, on the other hand, you had this weight on you because you cheated on your taxes for years and you got a letter and a call from the IRS and somebody came out and you got audited and they were looking over their, your paperwork and your records and, you know, you're hearing... 
Tisk, tisk, like, you, like, and they leave and say, you know, uh, this is not good what you did. <laughs> and you'd be feeling that weight. And they're like, well, we're going to get back to you on what the consequences are, but uh, you should be prepared. They're going to be pretty substantial. So what if you come home and your roommate says, uh, hey, um, I opened up your letter from the IRS and the cost that you were going to have to pay was pretty severe. You were, you were going to lose everything. Not only do you have to pay a whole bunch of money, uh, this house we're living in that you're making payments on, uh, you were going to have to sell that too because you have a criminal penalty coming. You're gonna, you were going to go to jail if it didn't get paid. And I know you don't have that kind of money. Now you're going to have a criminal record on the rest of your, your life. You're going to have that. You're going to lose your job. And you know, you're hearing that and you're responding, oh man, there was no way I could have paid that debt. I knew that was coming. I knew I, I, there was no way I could handle that on my own. And your roommate says, I paid it for you. I paid the whole thing. There's not going to be jail time. You're not going to lose your job. You're not going to lose this house. You're going to be able to keep going on. I, I covered the whole thing because I love you. Hmm. You probably wouldn't go, oh, thanks. You didn't have to do that. You know, I could have just handled it on my own. When we really understand the depth of how much we've wronged God, things that we've thought, things that we've said, the ways that we've acted, how we've hurt other people, how we've hurt ourselves, how we've offended even God himself. When we understand the wrath, the consequence that goes along with the debt that we had accumulated, that's a sustaining joy because it's not just, hey, Thanks, God. That was nice of you to, you know, cover up that little fault. <clears throat> it's like, wow. God, you have covered something substantial, something I could never pay, could never earn it or deserve it. You did all of that for me, and it, it, it moves you. And even if you've been in a place where you, you just sinned and you blew it again, and you're like, oh, I can't believe I did that. And then you meditate on, yeah, that's the depth of sin that I get myself into in this mess. But God forgave all of that, and he made me right with him. Don't you see? That's like a burden that gets lifted. It's like chains that fall off of you, and joy <clears throat> fills your soul with gratitude. And you pour out your heart and say, God, I can't believe you forgave me. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. It saved a wretch <laughs> like me. That's what happens when we consider the cost. What wrath would be on our lives without the merciful sacrifice of Jesus Christ? The Bible says the joy set before him, he endured the cross. There was something he was anticipating. And when we understand that, that depth from which we've been forgiven, it helps us to lift our heads. And so suffering doesn't have to keep us in this loop of just going around, going around. We're going home. We have a big eternal hope. And God will send outpourings of his love all along the way, road signs that are like, I got you words of encouragement, scriptures, someone praying over you, something that comes into your life that reminds you God is with you. God is with me. He's present here. And to understand that we have been forgiven with God for far more than we could ever imagine. And God has totally reconciled the account. It is cleared holy and blameless, and we get to run free.
free from what any wrath or consequence might be. That's how we have joy. That's how it's lasting. That's how it's sustaining, even in the midst of losing favorable circumstances. So let's hold on to joy, all right? Let's not stay in the loop. Let's not just skip and keep going on repeat, repeat, repeat. We need to start looking ahead with joy. It's a song here from Henry J. Van Dyke that was written. It's called Joyful, Joyful, Lord, We Adore Thee. And it says this, Joyful, joyful, Lord, we adore thee. God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness. Drive the dark and the doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Father, we thank you that we can have joyful, joyful love because we adore you and because you've loved us and we have an eternal hope that doesn't disappoint, we can have everlasting joy that never needs to go away. We get good reminders of your outpouring of love and we've been reconciled beyond anything we deserve to earn. So God, give us rest, give us peace, give us joy, help us to live into those fruits of the Spirit from receiving grace from Jesus, from filling ourselves and our hearts up with the Word and letting the Spirit of God speak to us and those roots to go down deep, deep, deep into the soil of your presence. Let us live joyful, joyful, because Lord, we adore, adore thee. Hey, we got another little treat for you here. Uh, our friends from Fellowship Church out in Monrovia did a really nice take on Joyful Joyful. So get up. You might end up moving a little bit. Turn the volume up and have some fun with this thing. God bless you. We'll see you guys soon.
Christ's adoration Celebrate him with a standing ovation God could have left us but kept us and blessed us With love, peace, and justice And just in case y'all forgot We gon' sing it out with a shout Too short for the stop, uh Thank you.